The British are coming. The British are coming. HCAT invites you to step back in time and enjoy a visit from Paul Revere at the Holliston Historical Society. Ladies and gentlemen, you're too kind. My name is Paul Revere at your service. Uh, I'm delighted to come and speak to you today. I've been asked to speak a bit about my life and my times. Uh, so I suppose I'll start at the very beginning. I was born in 1734 in the north end of Boston on Charter Street. My father and mother were, I, where do I even begin? My relationship with my father was never uh, pristine shall we say. I was the eldest of 12 children, eventually the eldest of the surviving sons. And there were high expectations from my father, who had been apprenticed as a very young man to a silversmith named John Coney. Now, if you're not familiar, so my father arrived in Boston, 1716, a French Huguenot fleeing from France as a fellow Protestant. Uh, when he informed the people of Boston that his name was Apollos Rivoire, they essentially told him they could not pronounce that, and later on we anglicized it to Paul Revere. <laughs> this is where my name comes from. Uh, while my relationship with my mother, Deborah uh, Hitchborn, was fairly well accounted for, I had a decent relationship with her, I had a fair relationship with my siblings, my father and I quickly came to blows when I was only 15 years old. I had become very fond of the Anglican church in town. It was known as Christ Church in my day. It's now the Old North Church. But at the age of 15, I got a job ringing bells for 12 cents a week. And inside that church steeple, I spent many, many happy hours. I also happened to notice some of the more devilish men of Boston climbing the tower after hours. And out of consideration for what they were doing, I stopped one one evening and was informed that the reason that I kept seeing seafaring men ascending the Tower of Christ Church was it was visible from all over town, including all throughout the harbor. Now, if you're not familiar, there was the Molasses Act of 1744 that put a small tax upon all sugar products coming from the Caribbean. This was not conducive to the 16 rum distilleries that were in Boston until my day. The average Bostonian by 1760 is consuming two to three gallons of the stuff per month. And there are those of us who do not drink, so some have to make up for the others when we talk of this average. <laughs> now, it's incredible how easily we were able to avoid these customs. With no other source of revenue for taxes, the British Empire depended upon these. But you see, there was simply a known system. When a ship captain might come into port, once the customs officer asked him how much he had aboard his ship, he would give him a quote of roughly 25%, and upon that he would pay a sixpence per pound tax. It was very effective. Kept us in money, kept the customs officers in money, and the only ones, nearly a victimless crime except for Parliament, who by the 1740s was engaged in a war that may, may or may not have come this far into history, King George's War, does this ring a bell? So by the 1740s, we're in a small conflict with the other big colonial power. We being, of course, the freest people on earth, the British Empire, being afforded all the rights displayed to us in the Magna Carta, did not always get along with the more oppressive French and their Native American allies, particularly the Wabanaki Nation up in what we now call Maine. Small conflict arose. My father did not fight. I never forgave him for this. I found it very cowardly. But my father also passed away rather young. 1754. I was only 20 years old, not even. And according to the law, one must be 25 years old to take over a silversmithing shop, and I had very, very little choice but to join the military myself. Conveniently, a war had broken out that same year, and by 1756 it had gone into full swing. This was the next of the wars with the French and their native allies. Perhaps you're familiar with it. We call this the French and Indian War. It's the Seven Years' War over the cross the pond, but for us, it's felt like an obvious and interesting option for me to attain some form of notoriety, some wealth, and I joined. I was sent to a fort at the base of Lake George, where I participated in an abortive attempt to take one of the French forts, but I earned my red coat in that moment, and it lived in a trunk under my bed from 17, 1757 onwards, because the moment I came home, I decided 
Firstly, I had the age at this point. I took over a touch early, but I was given a, a dispensation by the Commonwealth. I suppose it was the colony in those days. The Massachusetts Bay Colony allowed me to take over my father's silversmithing shop. I quickly married a woman named Sarah Orne, who I had known from growing up. And we began to produce many, many, many children together because that's what happens when you love your wife in my day. <laughs> the eight children that we had, sadly, I, I lived to quite the ripe age, and only one of my first marriage's children would survive me. It was my daughter, Mary. Please do not mistake, ladies and gentlemen, the idea that because of death's prevalence in my day that it became easier. It was not. It was just as difficult as it ever had been. And for me, the addition of more and more children was not simply a byproduct of loving my wife. We adored children. Every two years, on the money, we would have another child. <laughs> and during this time, it became more and more difficult to financially support my dear young family. The silversmithing provided some income, but it relied upon the kindness and the patronage of those more wealthy, who generally were part of the Tories. Now, just to familiarize you all, to remind those of you who already know, the Tories <coughs> tended to be very, very loyal to Great Britain. This was the system that had made them wealthy, and therefore the wealthy tended to admire it very, very much. Those of us who were in the artisanal classes and even the mercantile classes tended to veer towards the Whig party. We think of this as loyalists and patriots after the American Revolution. But I joined with the rest of the Whigs and very soon was persuaded to join the Freemasons, a fellow society of artisans and men who worked with their hands. It seemed a noble endeavor indeed, and we would gather by the Dre Green Dragon Tavern down on Union Street in Boston, and we would discuss the issues of the day, including the possibility of no longer being British once we started to feel oppressed. Because by 1761, it was very clear that the British Empire did not have our best interests at heart. As a matter of fact, one of the difficulties was with our very effective means of smuggling and bribery, the British Parliament was not receiving the proper tax dollars to perpetuate this war with the French and the Indians. And then therefore passed a law known as the Writs of Assistance. And this was the first moment in my life that I recall wondering whether or not this was in our best interests. The Writs of Assistance stated simply that because the Bostonians were so effective and efficient at smuggling, that our contraband had become impossible to discover. And moreover, that they knew who was doing it, they simply could not catch them red-handed. Parliament removed that impediment and said, essentially, you do not need to catch them red-handed any longer. If you suspect any Bostonian of smuggling, you may now enter his house with or without a warrant. You may seize any contraband that you suspect could be smuggled goods. And this was the greatest overreach. This did not conform to our ideals of being the freest peoples on earth, of being true and proper Englishmen. The rebellion was subtle, initially. It was a very loud and large speech, not far from my house, in Fanel Hall. Inside of Fanel Hall, and later on in the townhouse, the town meeting would meet, elect a speaker to speak on our behalf to make the proper complaints about this law. We chose James Otis, a friend of mine then and ever after, a fellow Freemason, and perhaps the most ardent orator I have ever heard. I was not present for this speech, but later a fellow son of liberty, John Adams, would call this the moment that the child independence was born. James Otis gave a five and a half hour speech which I have committed to memory and I shall now recite for you. <laughs> Allow me to shorten. I, the speech included the detail that with our charter from the king, King William had given us our charter in, 17, in 1691, and it stated very clearly, very firmly, that we maintained the right to tax and govern ourselves. That if the Bar British Parliament desired our tax income, that they might ask our local colonial militia, uh, legislatures, pardon me, I'm ahead of myself in the story. <laughs> we had the means to collect taxes, and we had the representation to decide what would be fair to collect. Parliament circumvented these proper channels and went directly to taxation. After the war, 1764, the first tax was on sugar. Now, I mentioned already, we had the Molasses Act in place. It put a 
pence per pound tax on sugar. The new Sugar Act reduced that tariff to three pence per pound. I can see your blank face as you're wondering what our complaint was this time. Well, you see, there's another piece to this law, which was simply this. The customs officers who previously had taken the word of the ship captains at how much was in the holds were now restrained and required to enter the hold of the ship and count for themselves, and any miscounting would be their responsibility in account. So the lowering of the tax to three pence per pound was not helpful when suddenly we had to pay that on 100% of the goods on the ship instead of the 25%. This was simply not the way things were done. There was the law, and there was the way that things were done. <laughs> and we felt some small offense. The other issue, of course, being, in addition to myself, many, many other men did not come back from this war. One in seven fighting age men did not return home to Boston. But their sons began to meet each other on the streets, and suddenly packs of fatherless boys consuming two to three gallons of rum per month began to form uh, small gangs. And when I say small, the South End Gang contained roughly 150 members. The North End Gang contained roughly 200 members until the Stamp Act was passed a year later, at which point membership grew to nearly 2,000, and we renamed it the North End Caucus. Furthermore, the conspiratorial group who had been meeting alongside us as the Freemasons in the Green Dragon Tavern, we watched the radicals on the side. Many of them were also Freemasons, but others, being staunch Puritans and disdaining the idea of tradition because it reminded them of the Catholic Church, such as Samuel Adams, William Molyneux, Thomas Cushing, if none of these names ring a bell for you, perfectly all right, but these nine gentlemen who would sit in the corner while the rest of us discussed proper affairs would discuss how to overthrow the British Empire. And although we knew what they were doing, we referred to them as the Loyal Nine. And their membership swelled after the Stamp Act as well. And I, in fact, conscripted myself into the brand new organization we referred to as the Sons of Liberty. These Sons of Liberty began to discuss this oppression by the British. Not simply the Sugar Act. The Stamp Act, 1765, was a deeper offense even than the previous one. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, the British Empire was not known for our literacy in my day. However, the colony of Massachusetts Bay was. While I worshipped with the Anglicans, and it caused the fist fight with my Huguenot father, I can tell you that the Huguenot, that the Puritans, that the Protestants in general found it very, very important not to listen to the ministers, not to trust the Pope, to have your own relationship with the Word of God. But how might you achieve this relationship with the Word of God? But well, you must read the Word of God, and how can you read the Word of God if you cannot read? And so in 1635, the Puritans of town had established for all freemen a public school known as the Boston Latin School, which survives to this very day, I'm told. The literacy in our town caused every edition of every newspaper to be treated like one of the most interesting relics, like the best treasure of the land. There was very little to do to entertain ourselves in the 1760s and to have a fresh opinion or edition or even a letter from a relative. You might read the thing 15 or 20 times before boredom set in. <laughs> the newspapers were our lifeline to the rest of the world. It was our primary form of entertainment. It was the only interesting thing happening. And when a tax put an impediment on this industry, Boston was perhaps more outraged than any city in the colonies. Furthermore, the newspapers, not enjoying the product of this tax, began to relate their opinions to the people of Boston, to the local town criers. In my day, the town crier was a man named Jimmy Wilson, later started a bar. It's called a bell in hand. You can still attend it to this very day, I'm told. Furthermore, the lawyers of the town who used quite a bit of paper themselves began to argue that the British Empire was charging us simply to be born and to die, for you must pay for a birth and a death certificate in the British Empire. That's very effective propaganda, ladies and gentlemen. This is where I began to understand how propaganda functions. One does not simply tell outright lies. One must first tell the truth. Then you lie. <laughs> that way people will believe you. The riots on the streets of Boston, I cannot say for certain whether I was there or not, but you can surmise it. 
The first happened in the South End. Andrew Oliver, the stamp tax collector, was dragged from his house in the pouring rain. We took him to his office, where we destroyed the thing with sledgehammers, crowbars, and our bare hands, then walked him to the hanging tree in the middle of the Boston Common, where an effigy of him stood alight already. Once the fire was out, we threw a fresh noose over the tree and suggested calmly that he resign. He said, you know, I was talking about that with my wife just this morning. <laughs> escaped with his life. Eleven days later, not one block from my house, lived the lieutenant governor of Massachusetts, whose name was Tommy Skin and Bones. <laughs> Thomas Hutchinson, his full name, but we don't care for him terribly, and if you have not already discovered this, in my day, the ideal of beauty would be to be slightly paunchy with a bit of jowl. This exhibits the idea that you must not work Certainly you are allowed to work, but you, mu you do not have to work. You may sit around living in the lap of luxury. We express this with our bodies. I understand it's a very similar thing that you express your wealth today by spending all of your time exercising and hiring a nutritionist. <laughs> the times, they change. Uh, <laughs> when Thomas Hutchinson was discovered to be living in the North End, all knew it previously. But the North End gang could not give the satisfaction to the South End gang of having produced the most popular and violent riot. And so on the 25th of August, a small group of the North End caucus of roughly a thousand men stormed into Thomas Hutchinson's house, burnt everything, stripped the thing down to its very timbers. And we delighted, we rejoiced. For this expressed ourselves in a satisfactory manner. And Parliament heard the Stamp Act was repealed before it went into effect. This may have taught the people of Boston a slightly uh, disingenuous lesson, which was that violent mobs work very effectively at making political change. <laughs> Two years later, the 1767 Townsend duties were passed, and despite our protests, did go into effect, putting taxes on all luxury items. And this, ladies and gentlemen, was the moment where I feared for the life of my family and for our well-being. For one of those items taxed, you see, was silver. Another was gold, lead, all precious metals. This was my livelihood. Without these precious metals, I had no customers. From 1767 until 1773, I made a grand total of three, count them, three teapots. This was effectively the destruction of my industry, the destruction of my family, and it is the moment that I began to look elsewhere for small sources of income. One of those sources, I found, could be easily obtained from training my work with metals into slightly finer metallic work in the form of dentistry. It was not long before one of my good dear friends from the Freemasons, a man named Joseph Warren, would come to me. Joseph Warren would later be made the head of the Board of Safety. He was the man who dispatched me on many of my famous midnight rides, which I will, of course, get to in a few moments. But Warren had a bad molar, and I replaced it for him with a silver tooth, which I attached to his bicuspid with a small wire, amongst others. I'll return to that detail in a little bit. It was very difficult going. With no silver, with no metallurgy. In addition to this, I became a courier. And this is where I began to discover that I had a skill that none other in the colonies had. I couldn't tell you why, but I felt at one with my horse, always. I was described by others as a centaur. I created a device for myself that kept me strapped into my saddle, and I confess that I was able to slightly nap at times while I was astride. <laughs> as a result, I could send a message. I could deliver one from Boston to Philadelphia in a mere five days. The fastest riders on the fastest horses would take six. Washington leaving the Continental Congress at Philadelphia and arriving in Boston would take 16 days. I was very fast. It was a talent I had not expected, having never owned a horse. The artisan class does not require such things. The town of Boston being all of two and a half miles all the way across, I did not depart it frequently enough to require one. And whenever I did, I could borrow one from the local deacons. In this same era, around 1768, we were invaded. The violence 
once again reared its ugly head, those who did not participate in the boycott of the Townsend duties were known to be Tories, and punishment was required. Suddenly, small packs of boys aged 8 to 25 would show up and protest and picket on the front lawn of anyone who dared to import. Tarring and featherings may or may not have occurred. Destruction of property may or may not have occurred. I, of course, was never present, which is why I cannot confirm or deny these things happened. But I will tell you that in 1768, a force of roughly 2,500 British soldiers came up the Long Wharf. And this was the first time I was approached for another interesting job that I began to take very seriously. The Sons of Liberty approached me and asked, would I make them a small wood carving that we could print over and over again of the invasion by the British. I may have exaggerated slightly the number, but the impression was unmistakable. 2,500 soldiers in a town of 15,600. Suddenly one in six men on the streets was law enforcement. And the feeling of safety, I assure you, was not the product, but rather the feeling of being watched over constantly of being accused of crimes that we had not yet committed. Very quickly, a letter circulated through all the colonies written by my good friend Samuel Adams and another one, James Otis, who I've previously mentioned. This circular letter, as we called it, was immediately discovered by Parliament, who demanded that we rescind such thing. And when 92 members of the House of Representatives of Massachusetts voted not to rescind, they invited me to make a silver bowl for themselves, which we call the Sons of Liberty Bowl which, as I understand, you may still see on exhibit at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Our defiance had reached a fever pitch, and the redcoats who were in town were primarily the second stringers. These were the Irish, making many of them Irish Catholic in our town of Puritans and Protestants and Huguenots. Furthermore, they were paid for four days of work every week. They began to compete with us for part-time labor down by the docks. Furthermore, they were soldiers, they had certain needs, they began to make eyes at our women. Very quickly, we began to shout insults at them. We referred to them not as the redcoats or the regulars they expected, but as bloodbacks, as lobsters. And soon they did not appreciate our derision, and fists began to fly. And finally, on the night of March 5th in the year 1770, five men were shot dead, unarmed, on the streets of Boston by a group of eight murderous redcoats. At least if you ask myself or Mr. Adams, that's not quite what happened. There was a small riot, but no riot act was read. And in my day, a massacre has nothing to do with the quantity of those killed, but rather with the injustice of the deaths. And in a town of 15,600, nearly all of us knew one of those five men who was killed, or one of the six others who were wounded. And the mobs on the streets of Boston grew to a size I have never before seen. We ordered the Redcoats to evacuate Boston, and they complied, withdrawing to Castle William, the primary fortress guarding the entrance to Boston. That same year, I would purchase my house in the North Square, in the center of the North End. And one year after this, I would gather my small army of children. I had six functional ones at that time. And I would make very small shadow puppets which we then projected via candlelight onto my windows on the anniversary of the Boston Massacre, depicting what had truly occurred, because the British had begun to muddle the waters by telling everyone that it was a bunch of mulattoes, boys, and Negroes, and not the rightful citizens of Boston who had protested this night. The North End Gang was whipped into a frenzy, and very soon I realized I had a relationship with them that could be taken advantage of in the event that my safety was ever in jeopardy. By 1772, the drama had begun to die down. After we ejected the British soldiers following the Boston Massacre, we had begun to behave ourselves in the mind of the British Parliament. They repealed the Townsend duties, all for one. They saved one to demand that we continue to pay, as was their right. They thought it was their right to place these taxes upon us. We continued to argue that it was not. But the one tax that remained of all the Townsend duties, luckily that on silver and gold was lifted, I was able to resume my work, but that on tea remained intact. The deep offense to this, as I understand that you live in an age where water is safe to consume, in my day it was not. It could quickly and easily kill you. 
tea, coffee, ale, cider, these things were safe to consume. And the British had just decided to overregulate one of those four items. This is the moment where these colonies switched to coffee. Sounds like a joke, it's not. The tea remained boycotted. But when the British East India Company sailed home from Bangladesh, having conquered a continent, losing many, many men, costing much blood and money, they found that their warehouses were rotting with moldy tea due to the boycott in the colonies and over-farming in India. They asked Parliament to bail them out. Parliament passed the Tea Act. The Tea Act simply stated they would buy all of the rotten tea and only rotten tea would be sold in the colonies from now on. My friend John Hancock could no longer maintain his contract with the Dutch East India Company. These parliamentarians would choose who they would do business with in the colonies. But whomever it was would be required to sell British East India Company tea and only British East India Company tea. And once again, to make this palatable to us, they thought they would make it one-third the price. It was now cheaper than smuggled tea. It was now cheaper than coffee. It was unavoidable. You could no longer tell the poorest of Boston not to purchase this tea. At that price, they almost couldn't afford not to buy it, it being one of the only safe things to consume as a libation. We knew that if the tea even hit the shelves, that our argument would be lost, that Parliament would win. We went to Philadelphia and encouraged them to send the tea back before it hit the shelves, and they agreed. We went to Richmond, Virginia, and asked them to send the tea back, and they agreed. I won't tell you what those loyalist Tory jerks in New York said, but I will tell you <laughs> that we in Boston were the closest geographic city to the British Empire, and the Eleanor landed on the 29th of November, followed by the Dartmouth and the Beaver several days later, and a clock went into effect. Nineteen days we had to find a diplomatic solution before on the 20th day it was the right of the British military to unload the ship for us, sell everything at auction on the dock, and make up the customs taxes they felt they should have received by then. On the 19th night, I attended a meeting in the Old South Meeting House in the south end of Boston. While John Hancock orated over the crowd and encouraged us all to maintain calm until we knew diplomatic solutions were no longer possible, Mr. Samuel Adams burst in, raised his meaty hands to his full height, and told us that there was nothing further that a meeting could do to save our country. Those of us already in the Sons of Liberty knew the signal. We retreated to the pubs where we put on the outfits of Mohawk Indians. Ladies and gentlemen, this was not a disguise. This was for plausible deniability, so that when the reddish redcoats asked us the next day who had done it, we could respond simply, I don't know, Indians. We painted our faces with lamp black, and once again, I cannot confirm or deny that I was there, but I can tell you it was a somber affair for four hours as we destroyed 340 crates of tea, 46 tons, 92,000 pounds, 33,000 pounds sterling, multiply by roughly 100, and it should equal today's money. <coughs> we destroyed three and a half million dollars of government property over the course of these four hours, and justifiably, rightfully so. I may or may not have participated in the beating of a man who decided that he would steal some tea from the large piles. It was low tide, and they grew to mountainous sizes. And we jumped into the water, and we took oars, and like spreading butter, made sure that all the tea was submerged so that no others could withdraw with it. When Parliament discovered what we had done this time, they responded with force. They passed the Intolerable Act. They referred to them as the Coercive Acts. They closed the Port of Boston. They informed us that if we wanted to reopen it, we would have to first pay them back the 33,000 pounds sterling. But with no port, we had no source of income. This was pure punishment. Furthermore, they forced the soldiers back upon us. And this time, we were forced to house them due to a small housing crisis the previous time. They had killed five innocent men in our streets four years prior to this. This was the force that would return. They could only be returning for one cause, and that was to continue their bloody deeds and to massacre us all. Luckily for us, in the 1630s, we'd gotten into a small fight with the Pequot tribe around the Rhode Island colony. When we wrote to the king asking for his military assistance, and it did not come for another eight months, when they landed, the war was over. We were finished. We asked if we could leave a standing army to protect us in the colonies. The king at the time told us he was not willing to do that. However, he would be willing to pass a law, and so he did. 
and in 1637 it became the law of the land that if you were in the colonies and you were between the ages of 16 and 60 and you were male, you must by law own a musket, come out to your town common and do regular drills, minimum once a year, preferably once a month. <coughs> to be very truthful with you, I'm aware that in London it was illegal to obtain a weapon of any kind, but in the colonies, particularly this one, if you were between the ages of 16 and 60 and you were male, you owned a gun by law. After the tea party, when the soldiers returned and it became clear they were here to resume their bloody deeds, it was very pressing upon us that each man obtain his gun, polish it, keep it in good place, make himself a box of cartridges. If you're not familiar with this, this is a simple piece of paper that we call the wad. You take a powder horn, you sprinkle some powder in there, you throw a lead ball in and you twist it all up. Ideally, you'll have 20 of these or so per box, and when it's time to load your gun, you'll take out a cartridge, you'll bite the bullet, as it were. You'll put your gun like this, you'll pour a little bit of powder into the pan, close the pan, put your gun upright, pour a little bit of powder into the back of the barrel, then you take the ball out of your mouth, throw that in, and then you take the wad, and you put that in so that when you go like this with your gun, the ball does not roll out. Then you take out your ramrod, you shove it all the way into the back of the gun, not too tightly. If you pack it too tightly, the gunpowder will not light, only small grains of it, and you'll end up shooting just paper. We call this blowing your wad. But we pull the ramrod out, we replace it, we aim our flint, we pull the hammer back, and when the trigger comes forward, the flint knocks the pan open, creating a spark which catches the gunpowder on the outside on fire, which goes through a small hole in the back of the barrel, catching the gunpowder on the inside on fire, and off goes the bullet. And we must prepare ourselves to load these guns up to three times a minute. Just describing it to you took me twice that long. <laughs> Drills. <coughs> Drills were the only response to the most powerful military on the planet, who had been protecting us up until very recently, and now were our foes and enemy. From their perspective, I understand that when they landed in Boston and found it empty, they just began to ask the Loyalists, the Tories, where everyone was. The Tories informed them they were in the countryside doing drills. And before long, the Redcoats began to make raids into the countryside <coughs> to obtain these weapons before we might use them upon them. This was the next moment where I found a part-time job, no longer as courier, but as messenger for the Sons of Liberty. In the middle of the night, I would be roused from my bed, often by Dr. Warren, for whom I had made the tooth. He would inform me that Portsmouth was about to be besieged, or that Salem, Massachusetts, was due to be besieged. And I, along with a squadron of nearly 60 other riders, would depart Boston, often via the Boston Neck, a very small isthmus of land which was heavily, heavily guarded by British redcoats, except for the hours that we knew them to be changing their guard. During the changing of the guard, we would exit. Occasionally, we would paddle away in a rowboat, until the British Navy became wise to what we were doing. And the 60 of us would spread through the countryside alerting the town militias. And when a pack of 500 redcoats would show up into a town, there would be a pack of 5,000 heavily armed farmers waiting for them. And the response generally was to turn around and walk home. Now Thomas Gage, who was in charge of this military activity in Boston, was no man's fool and began to realize somehow we were getting the word out into the countryside. We, having excellent espionage on for our part, also knew that he had begun to contemplate solutions to this. And this is when I recalled my time as a bell ringer in Christ Church. And I informed the Board of Safety that there could be a way to alert the countryside without us if the British should impose a curfew, if their navy should encircle and blockade the town. We could simply hang lanterns from the top of Christ Church. And the preset signal became, if one lantern were hung visibly to Charlestown, there was British military activity. If two were hung, there was British naval activity. Or if you prefer, one if by land, two if by sea. <laughs> On April 14th, Thomas Gage received a note from the Lord Secretary of the Colonies, Lord Dartmouth, demanding that he arrest John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who were now running the illegal provincial congress in Concord, Massachusetts, and staying in Lexington, Massachusetts. Furthermore, a squadron of men had gathered at Concord daily up to this point to protect the provincial congress and had gathered amassed, I should say, 15,000 muskets at Colonel James Barrett's farm. <laughs> 
It was Gage's duty to go and seize those weapons and execute the two leaders of our rebellion. And unfortunately, he began to make feints into the countryside, starting on the 14th. And I and my friend William Dawes and others would leave Boston under the direction of the Committee of Safety, fly down the Boston neck, warn everyone to discover that the regulars were not in fact coming out, that it had all been a feint. Our credibility was shot after three of these attempts. Furthermore, Gage began to discover where the crossroads were most convenient to plant arresting parties to ensure that the messengers would not escape. Finally, on April 18th in the year 1775, Dr. Warren alerted me at 6 o'clock in the evening that I should get ready to make a ride. I told him that a curfew had been imposed, that there was no way I would exit the peninsula that evening, and so I warned my friend Captain John Pulling, a vicar at Christ Church, who apparently found the sexton, Robert Newman, asleep at 9 in the evening, roused him, and the two of them each held a lantern aloft in the towers of Christ Church, not as a signal to me, but rather as one from me as I did not think that I would be able to emerge unscathed from the peninsula. At this point in my life, I had lost my wife. Sarah Orne, my wife, died in 1773 at the age of 37. My young daughter, Isanna, still in her arms. I took Isanna, knowing that her chances of survival were very, very minimal. And for four weeks, I nursed her, and I could not quiet her. She knew inherently that her mother was gone. And one evening, as I was walking through the North Square, in tears, knowing that I would not be looking into the eyes of this young girl for very much longer, a young lady named Rachel Walker walked up to me and asked if she could hold the baby for a moment. When I handed her Isanna, it was the first moment of peace I'd had in a month. And Isanna cooed and looked up at her, and I fell to my knees, and I begged her to become our nanny. Isanna, I should tell you, did not survive. This was May. By September, she expired. And we waited the proper month, but as you may have surmised, I have never met a finer woman than Rachel Walker. And by October, she was my wife. The following year, Six months pregnant, taking care of six stepchildren, I informed her I had to go out. She asked where, and I said out, because I did not want her to know <laughs> that my life was in danger that evening. But for the next six months, we were unable to be in touch. Because as I left my house, walking through the North Square, up to the ferry towards Charlestown, I got into a small boat, and as we began to paddle across, the oarlocks squeaked so loudly that we turned around. I asked for something to muffle the oarlocks. There happened to be a friendly neighbor nearby who threw her petticoat off of a second-story roof. I wrapped the oarlocks in that, and off we went, directly under the prow of the HMS Somerset, knowing for certain that this would be our doom, as the cannons were aimed directly at us. But the angle of the moon and the light on the harbor allowed us to slip past unseen. And in a wonderful bout of irony, in 1777, we captured the HMS Somerset with partially spiked cannons that needed repairing from a skilled metalsmith. <laughs> I got off in Charlestown. Deacon Larkin lent me his horse. It was a fine horse, fresh, named Brown Beauty. And off I rode into the countryside, and just past the Charleston neck, Charlestown neck, I encountered my first pack of redcoats. I could see them waiting from a distance off, and as soon as I saw them, I, I knew exactly what I would encounter for the rest of the evening, and I took a sharp right-hand turn on the road to Medford. Quickly, I heard hoofbeats behind me, and as I blasted as hard as I could into the farm of a man named Isaac Royal, he was the largest slaveholder in Massachusetts at the time, I knew his lands to be ample and expansive. My skills as a horseman paid off. Paul Revere the centaur lived up to his legend that night. Through Medford I went, rejoined the road in Monotomy, got all the way to Lexington where at roughly midnight, after an hour and a half on the road, I began to pound on the door of Mr. Adams and Mr. Hancock. 
Now, I would like to clear a misconception. There's a misconception that as I was streaming through the countryside, that I was making boisterous noise, screaming to all who could hear me that the British were coming, the British were coming. Allow me to disenfranchise you of this misconception. Uh, we were all British in 1775. That would be a weird thing to say. <laughs> I was informing those houses which I knew to be trustworthy, which I knew to be Whigs and not Tories, that the regulars were out, the redcoats, the lobsters, and that immediately upon my departure the militias must be roused. That said, when I did get to the Hancock Clark House, the minister's house in Lexington, I began to raise a, a small ruckus. A guard came out and informed me that a minister and his wife, their eleven children, the two most wanted men in the British Empire, also John Hancock's elderly aunt, his fiancée, many were in this house and that I was insane and should stop making noise. I informed them very loudly that they'd have noise enough soon, the regulars were out. And through an open window, John Hancock called out, we're not afraid of you, Revere, come on in. And in I went. <laughs> For 20 minutes I regaled him with the movements of the British in Boston. And then another pounding at the door made my heart leap into my throat, and I realized that there was a very, very good chance I had been followed by one of these arresting parties. As I shuffled them towards the back of the house, the footman opened the door, and I recognized the dulcet tones of my friend Billy Dawes. If you've not heard of William Dawes, it's all right. He's not the legend <laughs> that I am. But I will tell you, poor William Dawes had escaped the British. Later, it was claimed that it was bribery that got him past the British guards on the Boston neck. Well, I can tell you by the smell of him, it was the other thing that had in fact happened. He had dumped ale all over himself until he smelled like the most inebriated of us, had walked directly up to the guards, and had simply begun to repeat their questions. When they asked him, what's your name? He said, what's your name? <laughs> and they said, where are you going? He said, where are you going? And eventually had them so convinced that he would harm no one but his own horse that evening that off they let him go tipping his hat and telling them, thank you very much, Ossifer, he galloped off into the countryside to save the day. And when he arrived, roughly 12.30 in the evening, we proceeded to refresh ourselves. So it says in my depositions, I can tell you, we were in fact knocking back pints. <laughs> One must refresh oneself after an hour and a half journey by horse. And as we enjoyed our libations, and the camaraderie, and we knew that we had accomplished our mission for the evening, that these two men would not, in fact, be executed. We had no fear for the 15,000 muskets in Concord, you see, ladies and gentlemen, because a few days earlier, having surmised that the British knew about them, having received through our spy network this letter, we realized that it would be much more effective to move those weapons to Woburn. They were gone. They had not been there for three days. We had no fears. Therefore, a mission had been accomplished that evening. But at roughly one o'clock in the morning, Samuel Adams, who I've always thought of as the brains of the outfit, asked one more time for details, and as Dawes informed him that he had seen 700 or more redcoats piling into longboats to sail down the back bay, Samuel Adams surmised that perhaps 700 men were not making a secret raid to arrest two people, but rather on a weapons raid, and that we'd better get to Concord. So we put down our libations, put back on our riding boots, grabbed our crops, and by 1.15 in the morning, we're off yet again and bumped into a third rider. Now, the streets had been cleared by the idea of curfew, but when we bumped into Dr. Samuel Prescott, all three of us darted into the woods. And when Dawes and I realized that the other rider had also darted into the woods, we knew that it was somebody from our side of the allegiances. We called out, Ho oh, ho, who goes? And when we'd surmised that it was Dr. Prescott, I felt great joy. You see, if one wants to deliver a message into the countryside, one must make sure that it is into the hands of someone that one can trust. My fellow son of liberty, my fellow member of the Committee of Correspondence for the town of Concord, was the 26-year-old doctor, Dr. Samuel Prescott. We asked him what he was doing on the roads. Now, there's another story that has made its way through the annals that I'm afraid is not true, but it's too good not to tell you. And so Dr. Prescott was out visiting his girlfriend, Lydia Mulliken. But you see, at 10 p.m., Curfew went into effect, and her father had not yet come home. So like any colonial English gentleman would, Dr. Prescott nobly offered to stay the night with her. <laughs> At 12.45, her father did, in fact, return home. And so, once again, as any noble Englishman would, Dr. Prescott jumped out the back window and rode away as fast <laughs> as he could. And when we bumped into him, 
This was the moment where we realized that our credibility had been entirely dismantled by Thomas Gage and his strategy of the feints. He told us that not a soul would believe us on the countryside, but that everyone knew him to be an honest man. He had made so many house calls, you see, throughout the county that all of Middlesex knew Prescott to be an honorable and just man. We agreed to allow him to come with us, but I felt it would be unsafe, ungentlemanly, to allow him to lead, and so I rode point, with Prescott behind me navigating and Dawes manning the rear, and as we came around a hairpin turn in Lincoln, Massachusetts, there I saw them. Four officers who had already arrested a man and were interrogating him. Two were still mounted, two were on the ground, and I shouted, Officers! And Prescott came up, and we attempted to get through them. But they blocked our path, they pulled out pistols, they aimed one at each of our heads and said, Get into that pasture now, and if you do not, damn you, we'll blow your brains out. This is the moment that Prescott looked at me out of the side of his eye and I out of the side of mine to him and heard him shout, put on, which means go, 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 and in opposite directions we fled. Guns went off, we heard William Dawes galloping off in the other direction. And as I understand it from Billy Dawes later on, he came very, very close to being nabbed in this moment. But just as he was about to surrender himself to avoid the other fate of being shot to death on the streets, he came to an abandoned shack we had just passed and began to scream, there's two behind me, now, now! There was nobody there, but nobody knew that. <laughs> And the Redcoats, in fear for their lives, pulled up and ran. <coughs> Dr. Prescott, for his part, seems to have emerged victorious, going around the British in the swamps. Roughly one mile later, rejoined the King's Road, the County Road, the Country Road. It's the same road. It's one road. <laughs> and off he went to Concord, ringing the bells, warning the militias, saving the day. And we know that he was in North Attleboro by 11 the next morning, Rhode Island a few hours later. He continued his journey. I, for my part, would have done the same but for the fact that I imagined myself to be free and making towards a clearing where I could see some woods to hide inside and looking behind me, I was not able to surmise that six more officers were coming out of the shadows of those trees and by the time I saw it, I could not escape from them. They surrounded my horse, they put a pistol to my breast, they pulled me off the bridle and they told me that they were going to ask me some questions and if they did not like the answers, that I would not live the night. What's your name, they asked. Revere, I said. Paul, they said. I said, yes, sir. I said, what are you doing out here? I said, warning the countryside. What are you doing out here? <laughs> I had committed no crime. I had broken curfew. I was not prepared to die. And I had learned something about propaganda, if you recall. I told them everything. For the next two hours, I told them where Hancock and Adams were hiding out. I told them where our weapons store at Colonel James Barrett's farm had been. And I told them once more that there were 5,000 men waiting for me on Lexington Green, and if I were not there soon, they would come searching for me. There were 77 men on Lexington Green. Nobody knew or cared where I was, but this was not <laughs> an important detail for my safety. The important detail was that when Major Mitchell decided it was time for him to rendezvous with the principal column invading the countryside that evening, we began to walk towards Lexington. And roughly at the burying ground, the Lexington militia began to do a drill. And when I heard the gunshots go off, without hesitation, I said, here they come. And not knowing whether I was being truthful or not, Major Mitchell could not take the chance. Shoving me aside, he grabbed the bridle of brown beauty, and off they all rode, leaving me to wonder, was I just let go. And so I ran through the burying ground back to the Hancock-Clark house to make certain that Hancock and Adams had gotten away successfully, which they had not. This is now 4.15 in the morning. John, Adam, John Hancock was polishing a sword, demanding he be allowed to fight on the field and in fact command the men, and <laughs> complaining about some salmon that he wanted to roast for breakfast. <laughs> At this point, I took my riding crop, and with no patience left in my body, I began to slam both him and Mr. Adams towards his carriage. We got into his Parisian carriage and sped off towards Woburn, where I knew I could deposit them in an inn, where they would remain safe for the evening. Once deposited there, Mr. Hancock informed me that the British were walking directly at the tavern where he had stuck his entire staff, including his secretary, John Lowell, who had kept the trunk full of the most treasonous documents available, including our supply lines, our plans, the names of those we were due to meet at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, those of us who had met at the Provincial Congress in Concord, and that this trunk was an essential, essential item. 
and that he'd better go back and get it. I informed him that he had better stay here. He was not meant for the field, but rather for the cabinet. And off I rode with John Lowell, and we retrieved that trunk. We walked into the Buckman Tavern in time to hear Captain John Parker tell his men, stand your ground, do not fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Which I continue to think to this day were noble words indeed. With each of us at one end of the trunk, we pulled the thing towards the burying ground in Lexington, and at roughly five after five, I heard one small pop, and then two more, and then a barrage of gunfire. And we knew that something catastrophic had happened. And I would learn later, these were essentially the first shots fired in the conflict that would become the American Revolution. For my part, I returned with the trunk and the salmon <laughs> to Woburn, met with John Hancock, and proceeded to determine a way to retrieve my wife and children from Boston, which was occupied, and for six months I heard not a hair of her. I passed throughout various towns in the countryside, boarding eventually at Watertown, but I confess I spent time in Holliston doing odd jobs. I'd later have to pay some tax dollars towards that in 1775, which I felt rather bitter about. <laughs> uh, I then volunteered, hoped for a conscription in the Continental Army, but when General Washington arrived and found the disarray of the Massachusetts militias, I was consigned back to the Massachusetts militias as a colonel. And they stuck me in the same fortress that the British Redcoats had withdrawn to after the Boston mass Massacre, Castle William. And there I became the man in charge and renamed it. We now refer to this fortress as Fort Independence. And you can thank me for that matter. <laughs> uh, throughout the duration of the war, we realized that one of the primary difficulties was the lack of gunpowder or ammunition, which we were importing entirely from Europe. And perhaps my greatest contribution to the cause was going to Philadelphia to a rather saucy and embittered powder mill owner and operator. I learned the tricks of the trade from him. And when I came back to the Boston area, started a powder mill in Stoughton, Massachusetts, now known as Canton. After the war, I would, in fact, start a copper foundry there. There had been a new piece of technology where you could use a mill to roll sheets of silver, and I realized that silver was far too expensive to roll sheets, and I began to roll sheets of copper. Quickly, my sons learned this trade from me as well. And Revereware Copper, I understand, still survives to this day. We had many, many excellent con uh, commissions, including the top of the brand new State House in Massachusetts in 1802, the bottom of the USS Constitution in 1806. We began to forge things in bronze and brass as well, cannons, bells, several church bells survived to this very day, forged by myself and my sons. Of course, my military career ended in 1779 with a small expedition to Maine known as the Penobscot Expedition, and I mean to clear some air here. I requested the court-martial afterwards so that I might clear my name. I had indeed defied orders to go and rescue a flatboat in the middle of the bay because my men were not worth the lives of those men who were sitting ducks and would surely be executed. Eventually I relented and we did end up saving them. But I was dishonorably discharged and requested the court-martial to clear my name from what ended up being the greatest naval disaster in American history as far as I'm aware until 1941 in Hawaii. After the Penobscot expedition, I focused myself on my career, on metals, as well as my time with the Sons of Liberty, who quickly promoted me. And by 1795, the St. Andrew's Lodge that met at the Green Dragon Tavern promoted me to the Grand Master of those Masons. As such, it was my duty to bring the cornerstone on July 4th of the year 1795, to the top of Beacon Hill, the front yard of my dear friend John Hancock, who had departed some year and a half before that. And the governor, Samuel Adams, and myself, Grandmaster of the Freemasons, to great pomp and circumstance, laid the cornerstone of what would become the Massachusetts State House, along with a small box, which I understand they found very recently, a time capsule, if you will, into which we placed newspaper clippings from our day, coins 
<coughs> small notes from ourselves. I would lose in my lifetime 11 of my 16 children. Only five outlived me. I lost both of my wives before I expired in the year 1818 at the age of 84. I feel that I left a lasting impact and legacy through my coppersmithing, through my silversmithing, through what might be interpreted as propaganda. I call it art. <laughs> my depiction of the Boston Massacre thrives to this very day, which makes us look deeply like victims. I even placed a small puppy dog in the foreground looking out at you with his tail between his legs as if to say, can you believe this is happening? <laughs> my dentistry also provided some legacy in the form of Dr. Warren. Perhaps the greatest loss of the entire Revolutionary War was when Dr. Joseph Warren, who was due to be given a commission as a major general, but the orders had not arrived from Philadelphia, placed himself at the top of Bunker Hill, was offered command of the field, and volunteered instead to serve in the front lines as a private where he thought he'd be more useful. Bunker Hill was one of the other moments in American history where if we'd only had more metal, perhaps we could have won. But having run out of ammunition after the third charge of the British, when we began to throw rocks instead of shoot bullets at them, they knew that the day was won and they poured over the fortress. And Dr. Warren nobly held the retreat until he was the very last one. And we know that he never turned around and showed his back to them because the bullet that killed him went directly through his eye. And as his head snapped back and the men attempted to drag him off the field, the Redcoats pounced upon him, angry at their losses for the day. They turned this noble, noble man's body into hamburger. With their bayonets, every man who had not yet fulfilled his aggression was able to do so on the corpse of Dr. Warren. He was beheaded. He was stripped naked. He was shoved into a hole with another reb. So we learned later. Nine months later, Boston was liberated. This was the first time that we went home. And Warren's brother, who is now the president of the Provincial Congress, one John Warren, asked if there was anyone who would be willing to dig amongst the corpses to find his brothers. This is the moment that I informed him that there was a simple solution to find the exact corpse that belonged to his brother. He simply needed to open the mouth, look for the Revere silver stamp on the molar, and find the wire that connected it to the bicuspid. And this is generally regarded as the first body identified using these dental techniques in our history. I was the Board of Public Health in the 1790s, at the same time I held the Grand Master position of the St. Andrew's Lodge, during which time I surmised that those who would picnic with their deceased relatives might, up to six months later, obtain the same disease that had killed that same relative. And I instituted a law in Boston that one must bury a corpse at least six feet under the ground, a practice that had already gone into effect in Europe. It's a great effect. The list of my accomplishments I fear, must be something that you can read about. For my time orating to this crowd has come to an end. But I would love at this moment to open up to all of you the ability to ask me any question about my past with the caveat being that it's been roughly 200 years since I was living. <laughs> my memories can get cloudy, but thank you all very, very much for your hospitality. sung my praise, nobody crowned my brow with bays. And if you ask me the fatal cause, I answer only, my name was Dawes. Tis all very well for the children to hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. But why should my name be quite forgotten, who rode as boldly and well, God wot, why should I ask? The reason is clear. My name was Dawes and his revere. When the lights from the old North Church flashed out, Paul Revere was waiting about. But I was already on my way. The shadows of night fell cold and gray. <laughs>
as I rode with never a break or a pause. But what was the use when my name was Dawes? History rings with his silvery name. Closed to me are the portals of fame. Had he been Dawes and I revere, no one had heard of him, I fear. No one has heard of me because he was revere and I was Dawes.